Good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Brett Pazder from Emmanuel Soul Church English Ministry. And today we're going to be looking at a message. It's entitled, The Altar at the Entrance. And we're going to look at a passage from the Bible. It's Exodus 38, verses 1 to 7. Exodus 38, verses 1 to 7. They built the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood, three cubits high. It was square, five cubits long, and five cubits wide. They made a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns and the altar were of one piece. And they overlaid the altar with bronze. They made all its utensils of bronze, its pots, shovels, sprinkling, bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. They made a grating for the altar, a bronze network, to be under its ledge, halfway up the altar. They cast bronze rings to hold the poles for the four corners of the bronze grating. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. They inserted the poles into the rings so they would be on the sides of the altar for carrying it. They made it hollow out of boards. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Father God, we just thank you for this brand new day. We thank you, Father God, especially for Christ. Christ who made the way, Father God, that allows us to fellowship with you, that allows us to come to you in prayer, that allows us to come to you in worship and fellowship. And I pray, Father God, that in our daily life, we won't lose hold of the blessing that we've received through this, to be with you. So I pray at this time that as we go through your word together, which is a word that empowers us, strengthens us, Um, grants us really spiritual strength for our souls and for our spirits, for our lives. I pray, Father God, that that word, which is living and active, will really um, connect through the Holy Spirit to our hearts and that this will be a time, Father God, when we can just be in your presence. We pray, Father God, that you truly bless this time that we have together and we just pray all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, today, you know, as we begin this message together, I want to I want to ask you a question. You know, there's these fundamental questions that that we have in life, and if we ever pause from a lot of the distractions of this world and kind of what's going on, um, they all kind of come to us naturally. Um, there are questions of things like origin, you know, where we came from. Questions of purpose. You know, what is the purpose of life? What are we supposed to do? Um, and questions of, you know, how to live. Questions of morality. And for all people, this is a part of their nature to ask these questions, I think. Um, and we really find the answers to all these within Christianity. And especially within the gospel. And if you look at the gospel and, and just the word of God in general, you see that we were created by God. You know, that's our origin. We were created as a physical being, but also a spiritual being. And within that aspect of being a spiritual being, we find our purpose. Our purpose is to be with God. Now, everything is designed with a purpose. You know, birds are meant to live in the air, um, trees with roots in the grounds. Um, our purpose and our design as a created being, as a spiritual being, is to fellowship with our spiritual God, our Creator, to enjoy Him, to have fellowship with Him. And from Him, that is also where we get the answer to how to live. He lays down, as kind of the moral lawgiver, He lays down, you know, how we should live in a good way and is ultimately based on following His Word. So I bring that up at the beginning because if our purpose, our design, everything is geared towards this relationship, towards our time with God and spending time with Him, we have to acknowledge that there is one giant obstacle preventing people from entering into that fellowship, and that is the problem of sin. From Genesis 3, you know, we see this sin problem became a part of mankind. And because of that sin, we became separated from God. We became separated from that fellowship with God. And now I know there's a lot of people that don't believe in this. They don't believe in the spiritual reality. Um, They don't believe in Christianity. They don't believe in the gospel. 
But one of the things that we all know is there is an inherent problem that we all sense. Yeah, and, and we notice it. You know, when you commit a sin, but for most people, when, when they do something bad, let's say, there's something in us that feels wrong. When you commit a sin, do something bad, within our hearts, we feel this sense of guilt. You know, we feel shame. And a part of that says, you know, because we did something bad, we have to pay for it. Well, that's why if you look at people that, you know, do evil things, that commit crimes, that do sinful things, for us even, you know, we always feel that guilt and that shame. And so if you look at people that, that want to cover that up, that want to just keep on going with life and, and kind of do what they're doing, they turn to things like alcohol or drugs just to make themselves feel better. Um, and if they're not taking care of this, this problem and this sin and guilt that they feel of doing something wrong, ultimately it leads to, you know, mental problems. It takes different forms, emotional ups and downs and anger and upset. And they just, you know, have all these problems that come into their lives. Because within us, we have that sense that if I do something wrong, if I do something sinful that is bad, I have to pay for it. It's this guilt. But, you know, even without that, the sins you actually commit, because we are in a state of sin, we always kind of have this, this sense that something's wrong. We always have this sense of emptiness, of longing, of brokenness, of incompleteness, of being unsatisfied. It's because in our state of sin, we are taken out of that relationship. We are separated from God. So these are kind of the two big things that no matter what you believe or think, you kind of feel. The sense of, when I do something wrong, I have to pay the price. And even in the absence of that, you feel unsatisfied, unhappy, incomplete, because of that separation from God. And of course, we have this enemy, the spiritual being called Satan, that's going to try to bring things you know, into your life, cause problems and things that are going to make things worse and cause you not to focus on what you need to focus on, which is correcting that relationship. And he's going to put temptations and things in your life to distract you and lead you away from God, ultimately. So today, what we're looking at is through this tabernacle, and especially through this altar, we're going to see a picture today of a way to resolve this, this fundamental problem that we have. It's given in the past, fulfilled in Christ, and it's going to be applied to us ultimately through faith. So today, let's look at the first point, which is the altar of sacrifice. So the question you might have is, why the altar? Why do we even do this sacrifice? Why did they do the sacrifices in the past? It's because there is a spiritual law at work. You know, just like there's physical laws, you know, laws of gravity, you know, you know, laws of science that govern this world and how things work, um, there are spiritual laws as well. In Genesis 2.17, God said that if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. You know, and that's when they committed that first sin. So they died spiritually first. But in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin are death. It reinforces this idea that the payment for our sin is a life. The price of our sin is ultimately death. death. You know, put another way, it's a debt that we owe. And that debt is huge. That debt for that sin that we owe is death. You know, there's other spiritual principles as well connected to this. Um, you reap what you sow. You know, this comes from Proverbs 22. It says, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. It's kind of giving us this farming analogy that when you kind of, just like farmers sow seed in the dirt, we're sowing sin. And as it comes up and as it grows up, it's eventually going to produce a crop of problems, of curses, of disasters, and we're going to reap that and it's going to come to our life. So that's why when we sin, commit sins, or we're living this life in this state of sin, curses and problems have no choice but to come to us. 
So even in the Old Testament, they recognized this problem. And so what did they do? How did they exit from those problems, from those curses? How did they pay for that sin? In the Old Testament, there was this sacrifice system that was given to them ultimately by God. If you look at Genesis 4 in the Bible, it's the story of Cain and Abel. Now Cain, he offered up his, his breast crops, you know, the fruit and these things to God, the best of what he had. But it says God did not accept it, but he did accept Abel. Well, what did Abel offer up? He offered up some of his flock. It was an animal. The sacrifice of that animal was what Abel offered up to God. And so God accepted that. He didn't accept Cain's. Why? Because the price for fellowship with God, the price of forgiveness, is that a price has to be paid. And so Abel offered up that price, that life for his. It was a kind of a substitution for his life so that he can receive forgiveness and fellowship with God. Now, this isn't something that he came up with on his own. If you look back at Genesis 3, right after the sin, we see what Adam and Eve did. They felt the guilt, the shame, right, that follows sin, that feels, that follows something when you do something wrong, right? They felt embarrassed. They felt shame, guilt. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But this wasn't enough. So if you look at Genesis 3, 21, it says that God produced skins for them to cover up them. Because through that blood sacrifice, it was basically a payment for their life. That animal paid the price so they could, in a way, be covered of their sin, receive forgiveness. So that's where that, that whole sacrifice system starts from. And we see Abel followed that. That's why his was accepted. And we see following that, we see there was this continuous system of sacrifice for your forgiveness of sins. We see, you know, the patriarchs doing this. We see Abraham, when he wants to fellowship with God, he builds an altar. There's a sacrifice for his sins so he could fellowship with God. Today, we're looking at the tabernacle with Moses, right? They're building this altar and this sacrifice on this altar so they can have fellowship with God, so they can receive that forgiveness. It's a payment for their sin. During the time of, of King David and Solomon, this tabernacle becomes the temple, and there too they have that altar of sacrifice. This altar of sacrifice is always to pay that debt of sin that is owed. That life, that blood sacrifice, a life must be given. A debt must be paid. And what do we call a debt being paid? We call it forgiveness. Your debt is forgiven. It's washed away. It's taken care of. So at this altar, people go to the altar to seek that forgiveness. And this was the role of the priests in the Old Testament. When you wanted to meet with God, when you, you know, wanted to receive forgiveness, you, know, you had a lot of curses, problems come to your life, you needed it resolved. You would go to the priest with a sacrifice, you know, a perfectly unblemished lamb. And that priest, what he'd do is he'd take your sins and he'd transfer them to this animal and the blood of that animal would be shed. It would be killed in your place on this altar and offered up as a burnt offering in a way, kind of a payment for your sins to God to satisfy that wrath of God. The problem is in the Old Testament, this would be done again and again. You know, we are sinners by nature. It's a state of sin that we're in and sins come out of us. We commit sins. So whenever they wanted to receive forgiveness, they'd have to bring another sacrifice to God. So it's a continuous process again and again and again of bringing these sacrifices. And that's what that altar is all about. But we see the fulfillment of this was Christ. Christ died once for all. He was that Lamb of God, that perfect sacrifice. In Mark 10.45, it said Christ, He came not to be served, but to serve as a ransom for us. He is that payment for our sin when He died on the cross. In 1 Peter 1.18 and 19, it says, 
For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Your payment for your sin was through this precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, perfect. And through that, you are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are saved. You are purchased through the blood of Christ. That debt is forgiven now. It's wiped away. But to be fully wiped away, it needs to be cleared. That record needs to be cleared. It needs to be washed away, you could say. And so that's where we come to our second point, which is the role of the wash basin. This wash basin, or the bronze laver, you know, it was tied to this idea in the Old Testament of defilement, of uncleanliness that we have. So, you know, the priests would wash their hands and feet of all their defilement before entering into the holy place, which is the tent where they would meet with God. And we see in Exodus 30, it says that this wash basin was placed between the tent of meeting and the altar where the sacrifice was given. And they had to wash before going into the tabernacle of meeting and when ministering at the altar, or it says they shall die. So it came with a pretty heavy consequence, right? Before entering into the tent of meeting, entering into that place of fellowship with God, before entering into that tent, they had to wash in the wash basin or they would die. That's because they, they have to wash away that defilement before meeting with a holy God. And that's a part of the second important key thing to know is that God is holy. He is set apart. And in the Old Testament, they were trying to give us a picture of what that really means. That's why if they did something like, you know, even touch one of the holy articles, as a sinner, you would die. If you, you know, did something sinful and were trying to offer up like offering to God in a sinful manner, you know, it says even the priests, you know, some of the sons that were priests were doing this. And it says fire came out and consumed them because they were doing it and they, they were doing it in an unlawful manner. They were not doing it in the right way. They didn't respect the holiness of God, ultimately. God is holy. He is set apart. He cannot be with sin. And we as sinners, we cannot fellowship with this God that is set apart. We can't even enter into this holy place, the tent of meeting, with our sin and defilement. Now, of course, this defilement is a result of the sins we commit, but it's also the result of this state of sin, our root original sin that we carry with us. And so after the sacrifice is given at the altar, this payment for our sin, we go and there's this washing at the basin that's required to enter that holy place to wash away our sins. And we see this spiritual representation of this is that after this perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sin, we are being sanctified. We are being made holy. First, we are declared righteous. Then we are made righteous. We are made holy by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 2, it says we are set free by the Spirit from the law of sin and death. We are set free from that law of sin and death because the Holy Spirit, it imputes the righteousness of Christ on us. It's like washing us of our sin, so we're cleansed of that sin. And now we can enter into that place, that holy place of fellowship with God. So this brings us to the final point, which is kind of what both these things entail, which is it's the entrance to fellowship. And that's the third point today, the entrance to fellowship. You know, Jesus, especially in the book of John, he would refer to himself as, I am the way. He also refers to himself as, I am the gate. Now, in a way, he's this door, this gate, this way. Now, knowing he's saying these words, if you look back at the Old Testament, it kind of becomes clear what he's talking about. To meet with this holy creator God, two things must occur. A price must be paid for your sin and a cleansing 
must occur to make us righteous, to make us holy. And through that, the way, the door is opened to fellowship with the Father. And so within this tabernacle picture that we've been going through at the courtyard is this one way, this one entrance to fellowship with God. These two things that from the entrance into entering the tabernacle to the holy place, there's two things there, that altar and that basin. And so the last point is looking at the importance of this location. The location is at the entrance. Because what you're doing is you're exiting the wilderness when you enter into this holy place. When we enter this tabernacle, we're choosing to exit from the world in a way. And one of the reasons for the exodus, right, through the blood of the Lamb, through that sacrifice, they did that to exit from slavery. When we're entering into the tabernacle, we're exiting that world, that world tied to slavery to Satan, that world tied to the sinful world that we live in. We're exiting that world and kind of entering into a place of fellowship with God. And so that's why Christ is necessary. That's why the Holy Spirit is necessary to enter into that holy fellowship with God, the unique and only way to the Father. That's why I think just one verse kind of encapsulates both of these ideas. It's one of my favorite verses. It's 1 Peter 3.18. It says, Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so we may draw near to God. And so in this verse, we have the picture of Christ dying as a one time. It's the perfect sacrifice, the perfect payment for sin. It says, the righteous for the unrighteous. We are the unrighteous. Christ is the righteous, right? But it's this idea of payment right there. He is paying for our sin. He's paying the unrighteous person's cost <laughs> through his righteous sacrifice. Why? And that's where the second point lies, so that we can meet with God, draw near to a holy God. And that's where we get that wash basin, where we are made holy. We need to be washed of our sins. This is at the entrance, the door, you know, the gate, the way to the holy place. In conclusion, the last thing I want to leave you with today is the key to all of this is faith. Um, in Hebrews 10, 1 to 10, it talks about this system of sacrifice. And it says in Hebrews 10, 1 to 10, it says that this whole system of the sacrifice system, it was just a shadow of things to come, pointing ultimately to the fulfillment in Christ. But it says, as this shadow, it was, it was always temporary, right? Because the fulfillment would come later. But it was something that must be continuously done, right? We had to always continue to pay for our sins again and again and again. And the key thing it says here is that when they offered up those sacrifices at the altar, it says God was not pleased with it. It says it didn't actually take away your sin. When they offered up those sacrifices, it didn't actually take away their sin because it wasn't, a, it wasn't you actually dying for your sin, right? The full life, the full price wasn't being paid. So it didn't actually take away your sins. It says in Hebrews 10 that that was simply a reminder of your sinfulness. It was a reminder of yourself, your state as a sinner. And that points to the purpose of the entire law. The law isn't meant to save you. It is the same as this. The whole system of sacrifice, the law, is meant to point out the fact that you are a sinner and you cannot meet with that holy God as a sinner. And that is why a way, a sacrifice, a way needs to be made. But what's important about what they were doing is even though at the time it didn't take away their sin, they still did it in faith. By faith, they did it. And the actualization of what they did by faith came when Christ died on the cross. 
Thus, even though at the time it was ineffective of taking away their sin, the work of Christ on the cross, which came a lot later, that was kind of transcended back to their time and to that time when they acted in faith and saved them. Because you see, the point is this. Even in the Old Testament, they were holding on to the shadow of Christ when they were doing those acts in faith. They were holding on to the covenant of God. They were holding on to Christ even at that time. Today, you and me, we are holding on to that reality. We have the full picture. We see what it all means. And we know that reality is Christ dying on the cross. We're holding on to that reality. And that allows us to enter into that same fellowship that they did. To enter into that fellowship with God. And the key is, it is by faith we enter it. So that altar at the entrance, you know, we're doing it even today. We're not offering up a sacrifice because that sacrifice has been given once and for all and we just grab hold of it in faith and through that, we're allowed to fellowship with God. That is the altar of Christ at the entrance of the tabernacle. Let's pray together. Um, Dear Father God, I just thank you once again for this opportunity to just go through your word. And I know, Father God, a lot of times we see that, you know, the things in the Old Testament, the things that we're going through, it can be really complicated and confusing. But Father God, we know that all of those things, all of the books of the Bible, they're all pointing towards Christ. And so it's only through really understanding Christ that we can look back and fully understand it. So we thank you for that gift of Christ that we've received through that illumination of the Holy Spirit that allows us to understand. And we pray, Father God, that just like them, we will continue to act in faith, knowing that it is finished, that Christ paid that price. And so now, every day, we can have fellowship with you. Every day, we can come to you and enjoy that time of prayer. Enjoy that time of your word. Enjoy that time shining the light of Christ because we have entered into that holy place through the work of Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit being with us. And so all we can do now is just give back our heart of thanks to you for the grace that we've received. We thank you for all of this. And we pray that we can live our lives to all to give you glory and praise. We thank you. We pray that it's all in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week and join your fellowship with God.